Happy World Carnivorous Plant Day. My name is Noah Juvie, and today I'll be going over some of my observations on Drosera section lawsuits FA, or the Petiolaris complex in cultivation. I've already tried filming this video a number of times, and in one way or another, it tends to uh, spiral into me ranting about Sundays for an hour. <laughs> but hopefully, uh, this take will be a bit more concise and actually helpful. So before getting into uh, the plants and cultivation, I think it's important to kind of uh, understand the climate they're native to in the wild. So Petiolaris drosera are restricted to, more or less, restricted to uh, northern Australia. So those are the states of Western Australia, as well as Queensland, and uh, the Northern Territory as well. So you aren't going to find uh, uh, Petiolaris complex drosera uh, co-occurring with tuberous drosera or pygmy drosera or cephalotus down in southwestern western Australia. Um, but they're, they're more native to these uh, tropical regions farther north. So Petiolaris habitats experience relatively constant and constantly warm, mind you, uh, temperatures throughout the year, um, although rainfall does vary dramatically uh, seasonally. Um, uh, Petiolaris growth mostly occurs during the um, uh, rainy season, the wet monsoon season, while uh, plants persist in some dormant state, whether that be in the actual dormant plants or just dormant seed in the few annual taxa of this group during the dry season. So here are some climate readings from Kakadu National Park, Northern Territory. And uh, you'll see typical Northern Territory uh, Petiolaris complex species growing in Kakadu National Park, which are uh, things like Drosera paradoxa, Drosera fulva, Drosera dilatato petiolaris, Drosera um, brevicornis, and Drosera darwinensis. So you see the temperatures, they're relatively constant throughout the year, uh, temperature highs, temperature lows, and uh, um, pretty warm <laughs> at some times of the year, uh, over 35 degrees uh, Celsius during some months. Uh, rainfall, on the other hand, it varies dramatically. The monsoon season occurs primarily from December to March or so. Uh, after which the rainfall will decrease until you're at the dry season, um, which is dry season uh, equates to dormant plants. So they'll uh, usually start growing in uh, November, December, whenever the rainfalls return. So here are some uh, Drosera ordensis plants, uh, all in the Kimberley region of Western Australia during various stages of seasonal development. So these are not my photos, all just taken from iNaturalist. Um, but here's a small colony of plants um, in early monsoon season. So you see uh, these new leaves being produced are uh, large and fully formed. Uh, looking very healthy and they're being produced at quite a rapid pace at this time of the year. And uh, the plants are sending up uh, uh, many inflorescences, uh, oftentimes multiple per plant this time of the year. So um, they'll be blooming and if pollinated by another genetically different individual, um, they'll be producing seed. Now here's a plant uh, a bit later into the dry season. Um, I think it's uh, worth noting that at in early June, um, some species will likely be fully dormant, like Drosera falconeri. Um, those Drosera falconeri that grows in kind of uh, swampier habitats, and it's going beneath the soil uh, <laughs> as soon as the rainfall stops. But Drosera densus can persist a bit later into the season, um, uh, just due to the dense covering of uh, dendritic hairs on its leaves. Um, anyways, uh, you see these plants uh, they're producing reduced leaves, which is a good indicator of the dry season. Um, these older leaves uh, that were produced during uh, uh, what you might say are happier times <laughs> are starting to die off, and the plants will be reduced in this uh, superficially small uh, rosette. And this spent inflorescence up here should have uh, uh, dropped most of its seed by now. Now here is a undeniably dormant Drosera densus plant in late July, so the peak of the dry season. Um, so this plant is pretty much just uh, persisting as a uh, petiole rosette, um, very hairy, 
Um, it doesn't have any active lamina. It's probably too dry to produce uh, lamina at this time of the year. And you can just tell that the soil, the soil obviously is quite dry. Um, so the plant will kind of remain like this until uh, conditions change in one way or another, which can either mean um, the monsoon season returns, the annual rainfall stimulate growth, or uh, as been noted that uh, the low intensity bushfires that uh, occasionally roll through this region of Western Australia can have a similar effect of uh, stimulating growth in a number of species. So the Petiolaris complex Drosera is named, the Petiolaris complex of Drosera uh, is named after the first species from Section Lassus Fa, which was uh, discovered, which would be Drosera petiolaris. And if I remember correctly, Drosera petiolaris um, was uh, discovered in Queensland in the uh, late 1700s on the historical Cook expedition, although it wasn't described until uh, the 1800s, uh, early 1800s, I believe. Once again, if I remember correctly. <laughs> and um, uh, Petiolaris just references the particularly uh, long and uh, uh, pronounced petioles of um, Drosera petiolaris, a trait that is reflected um, throughout uh, Section Lassius Fa, mostly. Um, and this, this plant is actually a Drosera rodensis, <laughs> but I thought it was a good demonstration of petiole and lamina on this complex. Um, so the petiole is just going to be the leaf stalk and lamina um, the leaf blade. Um, so the lamina in petiolaris Drosera at least are exclusively the carnivorous portion of the leaf. The uh, petiole does not aid in trapping or digestion uh, whatsoever. Now, on to the cultivation of this group. Um, I will preface this with my opinion that uh, petiolaris drosera are easy plants to grow. Their um, conditions, their preferred conditions at least, are a bit uh, different from more commonly encountered uh, sundews uh, in cultivation, which has earned them a reputation for being a bit difficult. But once you've got those conditions dialed in, once you know what they like, um, they're very, very vigorous and floriferous plants. Um, they very, very quick growers, and they'll uh, easily bounce back um, from near nothing <laughs> in a shockingly short amount of time. So temperatures. Uh, perhaps one of the most important aspects of petiolaris culture uh, are temperatures. Um, Petiolaris drosera like warm temperatures. Um, uh, I try and keep my temperatures between 70 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. If your temperatures are dropping below 70 degrees, you might want to think about uh, installing a heater in some way. And this could be as simple as a, a little fish tank heater suspended in a reservoir of water at the bottom of a growing setup, or which is usually a terrarium or something. But uh, anyways, here are some temperature readings and humidity readings too from three of my Petiolaris complex setups. Um, so temperatures, they stay all relatively warm. Um, so Petiolaris dresser grow very, very quickly in those warm temperatures. And if um, your temperatures are getting too cold, you might see reduced leaves in Petiolaris sundews or slow growth. And uh, if you fail to uh, adjust your moisture level accordingly, um, which I'll talk about later, <laughs> um, you might see rot. So uh, try and keep those temperatures up there. Watering. Um, I wouldn't say this... Uh, aspect of petiolaris culture is as straightforward throughout the uh, section as a whole. Um, some species like more water than others. I will say that I keep all my plants in trays and um, use the tray watering system. Um, so that's just pouring uh, water into their little trays and having the plants uh, suck it up through the bottom of their pot. Um, but some species like to dry out a bit more than others. Uh, some taxa, um, mostly the species that have uh, uh, more of a dense coating of hairs on their petioles, um, uh, grow in these more well-draining and arid environments in the wild. So it should be expected that they might not like um, as much water as something that grows in uh, occasionally flooded habitats like you might see with fulva or Drosera falconeri. Um, so these species, which I keep in these two trays, or at least in this setup. Um, so these species are like Drosera lanata and Drosera lanata type. Um, 
Drosser lanata from Queensland. And I say this because uh, other plants, um, namely Drosser lanata from Northern Territory, um, are completely different taxa, um, and they behave more like fulvas in my experience. But actual Drosser lanata from Queensland is uh, native to these more uh, well-draining environments that are uh, always above the uh, flood level, even during the middle of the monsoon season. So, anyways, Drosser lanata, Drosser derbiensis, Drosser brevicornis, Drosser darwinensis, and Drosser ordensis are the species that I've noticed uh, like to remain a bit on the dry side, once established, of course. Um, if you have uh, damaged roots from these plants being banged up in a box <laughs> over an extended period of time on new plants, um, you're, want, you're gonna wanna keep them a bit more moist just while they're establishing, of course. But once they're established, they can dry out a little bit more. So I fill up these trays to maybe about like half an inch of water, and usually within a day, um, that amount is gone in the trays. And I'll wait a few more days before filling it, filling it up again. But I never let the soil, the surface of the soil uh, get uh, like bone dry like you might uh, see with a dormant tuberous sundew or something, but um, it, I don't let it stay uh, obviously sopping wet either. So um, I've noticed this benefits in uh, really good root growth um, as well as uh, uh, avoiding rot. It really helps avoid rot, which I'll talk a bit more about later. Um, the other species I keep um, uh, in trays as well, but I more constantly maintain them around um, half an inch of water. They don't really mind uh, wet feet as much as uh, the hairier species. Humidity and airflow. Once again, um, a bit of a uh, requirement that is more divided among the section as a whole. So Petiolaris drosera, um, some like Drosera falconeri, uh, Drosera canelii, and Drosera fulva, I've noticed, um, are a bit more dependent on higher humidity for uh, adequate growth. Um, and without uh, good humidity, and by good I mean <laughs> between 70% uh, and 95% or so, you might see uh, stunted leaf growth or um, scarring on the backs of new leaves or undeveloped lamina, which can be a problem with falconary when it's growing too dry. Um, these falconaries have been growing like between 80% and 95%, and they're looking really healthy with fully developed lamina. I just brought them out from a setup where it was too dry and they were producing uh, undeveloped lamina. So they really do appreciate higher humidity. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we have the species that I uh, talked about earlier that uh, are naturally native to those more well-draining and uh, arid environments. And these species produce a, a dense coating of hairs on their petioles, which naturally protects them from uh, a water loss a bit more than something that's uh, predominantly glabrous like um, uh, Drosera falconeri, for example. Um, so those species, you don't have to worry as much about uh, humidity, um, however, do make sure to provide good airflow, because um, those very hairy rosettes, um, if they're staying uh, swampy and stagnant, uh, that is a recipe for rot. <laughs> so make sure you have really good airflow for those ones, um, and this can be uh, accomplished by like installing a little simple computer fan in their setup and setting that up to a timer that runs for like 15 minutes every hour or something. And uh, they're not as picky about humidity. As I said, I've grown them in like 40% humidity without issue. Um, the, that dense coating of hairs on their uh, petioles generally protects them from dry, drier air. Um, so yeah, a uh, bit of a, uh, just my observations I've noticed on humidity and airflow uh, within the petiolaris complex. Uh, media, soil mixes. Um, I currently use peat-based mixes for all my petiolaris sundews. And uh, they're pretty easy going with soil. Um, you don't have to do anything special, but just mix the peat with something that will aerate it a bit. Um, and I use sand, perlite, or pumice. Um, all those work well. Um, I will say that some species do uh, generally appreciate a mix that is more uh, airier and 
well draining than others. And uh, you'd probably guess <laughs> what I'm going to say. Um, there are those species that uh, naturally are native to more well draining environments. So mix uh, a bit more perlite or pumice or sand in with those mixes. Um, they don't really like uh, super dense or moisture retentive media. Um, they can rot out easily with that. So, um, falconeri, canelii, um, fulva on the other hand, they're good with something a bit peatier, provided your temperatures maintain your temperatures are maintained warm. So they don't mind uh, uh, those dense, wet mixes as much. Um, in the past, I have used a completely inorganic mix, which was fluval and perlite or pumice, um, with success. Um, it, with my Petiolaris Complex Sundews. Um, the only downside to this mix is that it is uh, a little expensive. <laughs> um, fluval is an expensive soil ingredient. And uh, just something to note that when mixing your fluval um, with perlite, the perlite will float. So if you're top watering a lot, um, the perlite will float up to the top and uh, eventually make a layer of perlite on the top of the soil, which uh, I don't really like that. Um, but pumice works a lot better because pumice will uh, do no such thing. <laughs> Anyways, um, yes, uh, I have experimented with uh, long fibered sphagnum moss mixes in the past, um, but I, I can't say that I've been impressed with them. Um, long fibered sphagnum moss mixes and petiolaris sundews, um, they don't really go together. Petiolaris sundews uh, in the wild naturally occur in these uh, sandier and uh, siltier soils, um, generally speaking. They're not really a sphagnum associated species. So sphagnum seems to hold on to a bit too much water uh, for a longer period of time than my liking. And um, uh, you, you sometimes see plants raw out. Um, if they're growing in this uh, sphagnum moss media. Um, as I said, <laughs> petiolar sundews aren't going to be growing in like a, a purpurea sphagnum bog in Michigan or something. Uh, they don't like um, that uh, moisture retentive media. Um, so anyways, in summary, you can easily just use something peat based um, mixed with sand, perlite, or pumice. Um, and then if peat isn't available in your country or whatever, um, you can use an inorganic mix of fluval. And I've also seen uh, uh, Akadama and Kanuma uh, used with success in the past, although I uh, have not uh, tried it myself yet. Um, once again, those uh, mixes are a bit spendier as well. <laughs> Issues. So, etiolation, uh, simply increase your lighting intensity. Here are some fulvas, both genetics from Nunama, Northern Territory. So, these plants are uh, greener, um, a bit etiolated, uh, not quite unhealthy per se, but um, they can get uh, prettier <laughs> if they're exposed to more light. Um, and I can't imagine them blooming at this stage. This one, uh, you can see this. Uh, stalk it's just sticking right out of the rosette so this plant is blooming and very happy um, but yeah simply bump up the light and you'll get something with a uh, really really bright and colorful and pretty lamina like the specimen shown and uh, quite a bit dewier too stunted growth and humic acid staining um, stunted growth is most commonly seen when your temperatures are too low, the temperatures are just naturally slowing down leaf development, or when your humidity is too low, which is causing the lamina to not develop fully in something that might like quite a bit more moisture and humidity like falconeri or canelii. Um, yeah, uh, just uh, bump up your humidity in those cases, um, maybe keep them a bit wetter. Um, and you should see uh, fully developed lamina instead. And sometimes you also see scarring on the back of the leaves, but that can be from humic acid staining too. So uh, humic acid staining is something you see with a lot of other drosserids, not only restricted to section lossius falla within the genus. Um, it's a pretty common issue with most cultivated species, just common stuff like Alicia and Capensis. And that means your peat has this likely means that your peat has degraded, and if you uh, pick up the pot and smell the bottom of the drainage holes, it'll uh, uh, likely smell pretty bad, <laughs> um, like rotten eggs. Um, and that indicates that it might be time for a repot, and you might want to try out uh, air your mix, and maybe not uh, keep it as wet. 
Um, pests most easily treated with an imidacloprid based uh, insecticide, um, in my experience. Um, so this is just common stuff that you can find. Um, I use uh, Bayer, or I think it was formerly known as Bayer, uh, just it's now known as like BioAdvanced 3-in-1, and I use their mix with imidacloprid, and that's a good ingredient that I've noticed that really helps uh, uh, eliminate um, uh, common troublesome carnivorous plant pests like uh, mealybugs, uh, thrips, and even a scale to a certain extent. Um, but yeah, haven't had an issue uh, with uh, Petiolaris drosera and treating with um, imidacloprid-based insecticides. Um, they're not any more um, uh, picky about insecticides than any other sundew. And of course, the lamina <laughs> will look a bit uh, ratty after you miss them down, but um, they'll recover and will look uh, better in a while just because uh, you've got rid of those pests. Now, rot. Um, in my opinion, rot is the most problematic issue uh, seen with Petiolaris drosera on cultivation. And I think in the past, I've uh, seen this uh, issue called Petiolaris sun death syndrome or something. And uh, in my experience, it's more similar to the rot that is uh, seen in uh, just other carnivorous plants like um, Sarcenia and Darlingtonia and even uh, Nepenthes vascular diseases to a certain extent. Um, so you'll likely be notified rot is affecting your plants because the leaves look dehydrated. Um, rot is a issue with the vascular tissue, the stem tissue, and um, if they can't uh, uh, transport adequate moisture to the leaves, um, uh, it's uh, likely that they'll be looking dehydrated. <laughs> um, so yes, rot is likely an issue that's been caused by uh, some pre-existing horticultural inadequacy. Rot is most prevalent in the species that naturally produce those more hairy petioles, in my uh, experience at least, and um, it's usually caused by keeping them too wet. So maybe their feet have been a bit too wet, um, they've been uh, sitting in too much water, or maybe they haven't been provided adequate airflow. Maybe their humidity is like 95% and they have no airflow. <laughs> Um, and then rot is further compounded by cold temperatures. Cold temperatures, super wet conditions, they mean rot. And uh, if you have a plant that's rotting, um, the leaves will just come off in tufts. They're not anchored st substantially to the stem tissue anymore. Um, and then when you take a look at the stem tissue, it'll just be brown and mushy. And uh, basically exactly what you see with Sarcenia um, rot or Darlingtonia rot. Um, so you want to, if you have a plant that's rotting, you want to uh, perform a bit of surgery on your plant, <laughs> chop away all the rot, and plant it in fresh soil, um, airy mix, um, and hope for the best. But the best uh, way to combat rot, in my experience, is uh, preventative. Um, just keep those hairy species that be on the drier side, once established, of course, um, and usually rot won't uh, give you problems. Um, also, make sure to provide good airflow, uh, once again, for those hairy species. <laughs> and um, temperatures also play a, a key factor in um, uh, preventing rot. So you want good warm temperatures for adequate growth. If your plants are slowing down and they're being kept too wet because of uh, cold temperatures, um, rot has a higher chance of uh, affecting your plants. So dormancy. Um, uh, Dormancy um, isn't really necessary for Petiolaris sundews in cultivation, in my experience at least. It's more of an environmental response as opposed to like a, a seasonal cycle that you might see with like uh, tuberous sundews. Um, so in Petiolaris sundews, it seems largely environmental and um, not really necessary uh, in cultivation. However, I find that it is uh, oftentimes uh, unintentionally <laughs> induced in cultivation by dropping the temperatures. Um, if you uh, go back to the graph of the climate of Kakadu National Park, um, you'll see that uh, the dry season correlates with a slight dip in temperatures. Um, nothing huge. Uh, Petiolar sundews um, habitats remain relatively constant in temperature throughout the year, but it is a, a dip nonetheless. 
Um, so oftentimes, if your temperatures are dropping in the wild, the plants will think that the uh, dry season is knocking on the door, <laughs> that the dry season will be coming soon. So they uh, produce these reduced leaves um, that are uh, oftentimes quite a bit hairier as a preparation as a dry season adaptation um, and if you keep the plants uh, the same moisture which is uh, very moist um, the plants will uh, they have a higher chance of rotting out um, so yeah if your plant is going dormant um, you can try boosting the temperatures to uh, reverse the dormancy <laughs> and get your plant growing quickly and flowering again because as I mentioned earlier um, in my experience dormancy isn't required in cultivation to maintain healthy specimens for uh, at least a few years um, or you can just uh, keep the plant on the drier side because rot isn't an issue um, in of it, I mean, no, dormancy <laughs> isn't an issue in of itself. Um, it's the failure to uh, properly adjust your uh, environmental conditions uh, to dormancy, which usually results in issues uh, in the form of rot. Um, so you want to keep them on a bit on the drier side if your plant is producing these very, very reduced and uh, hairy leaves. Like here's a Drosera fulva. You can see the older leaves, they're starting to die off and they were a bit more glabrous. Um, these new leaves, however, are much hairier. So this plant was exposed to a bit colder, a bit of a uh, colder uh, environment for some time. And um, the new leaves that were being produced are uh, much smaller. Um, these leaves won't grow anymore at this stage. They have fully developed. Um, you see the lamina have fully unfolded. So they're not going to be growing as big as the other ones. This is just uh, how they are. So once these older leaves completely die off, the plant will look a bit smaller. Um, yeah. So dormancy is not only induced by temperature. As you'd probably guess, dormancy can also be induced by um, dry conditions or a reduction in humidity. For example, um, here's a Drosera brumensis plant. Uh, this one is from the uh, Deep Creek, um, Deep Creek um, in the Kimberley region of Western Australia. Um, and uh, I installed a new fan uh, into one of my setups to uh, increase airflow, and um, it also decreased humidity a little bit. So this Brumensis uh, decided that I might want to go dormant. <laughs> Um, this is a mature plant. You can see that uh, from just from the peduncle sticking out of the uh, older leaves of the rosette, um, but it has produced these much smaller new leaves, um, which is just a typical dry season adaptation. So I moved the plant to a much more humid setup, same temperatures, just more humidity. And just 15 days later, this is how it's looking. It's produced uh, many um, much larger leaves and is coming out of dormancy. Um, the leaves aren't quite as hairy as you want, as these ones produced uh, in the drier conditions, which is uh, a typical um, environmental response you'll see uh, with many petiolaris drosera. Um, drier conditions equals um, hairier leaves. There's certainly a genetic aspect to it as well, but generally with uh, uh, many species, that's what you'll see. Um, so anyways, yeah. Uh, dormancy, just something to keep in mind, and uh, if your plants are going dormant, uh, do not keep them wet. That is <laughs> the um, number one lesson here. Undescribed taxa. So previously, I talked pretty generally about um, the petiolaris complex. Um, that is because there are a great deal of uh, undescribed species that are in cultivation, as well as um, uh, at least several um, currently described species that are um, not in widespread circulation or uh, even in cultivation, uh, to my knowledge, uh, for some like Drusser stipularis, which was the most recent addition to the described petiolaris complex species. So here's Drosera offlanata from uh, Northern Territory. Um, so this one is from uh, Flying Fox Creek in particular, and uh, I have a couple colonies right here. And this plant is not Drosera lanata. True Drosera lanata is restricted to Queensland. Uh, this plant occurs a bit farther west in Northern Territory. And it is not Drosera lanata. Um, it behaves a lot more like fulva to me in its clumping habits and uh, its tolerance to wetter conditions. 
Um, so, yeah, just uh, makes petty lars culture <laughs> a bit more confusing with all these uh, undescribed species floating around. Um, over here, here's uh, uh, Aft Brevicornis from Western Australia. So, true um, Brevicornis is supposed to be um, just native to uh, Eastern um, Northern Territory as well as Western Queensland, if I remember correctly. Um, while this plant is way far west in Western Australia, uh, Mount Bonford in particular. So this is likely an undescribed species too, or either range extension of Drosera brevicornis. And what makes um, the Petiolaris uh, uh, issue <laughs> of taxonomy a bit more difficult is because these plants are uh, uh, have a very, very high level of uh, what you might call uh, phenotypic plasticity. So uh, growth produced in one set of conditions is very different from growth produced in another set of conditions. Uh, just for example, uh, the coating of uh, indumentum on each leaf. Um, obviously, this has some uh, genetic aspect as well. Um, for example, if you have a glabrous Drosera ordensis, um, uh, you aren't going to have a dr glabrous Drosera ordensis unless you've done something horribly wrong. Same with a glabrous Drosera derbiensis. They're just uh, naturally produce those very, very hairy leaves. However, others like this F Flying Fox Creek off Lanata, um, the amount of hairs they produce on their leaves are uh, very, very environmentally dependent. Um, drier conditions uh, will naturally um, produce uh, quite a bit more um, hairs on the leaf. They'll look very, very fuzzy, like almost like true Drosera lanata, which is another uh, seemingly always <laughs> hairy one, or at least in my um, conditions, it's always hairy. Um, but yeah, uh, another thing is that Petiolaris Drosera love to hybridize in the wild. Um, even species that you wouldn't say, uh, hey, those look similar, they might be uh, hybridizing wherever they co-occur. Um, no, even very, very different stuff, <laughs> um, like Drosera falconeri um, and Drosera brevicornis in uh, Northern Territory. Um, they cross and they produce offspring that looks almost identical to Drosera canelii, which uh, is a bit difficult from a taxonomical perspective at least, and I'm not suggesting Drosera canelii is a hybrid between Drosera falconeri and uh, uh, Drosera brevicornis, just an interesting observation that makes, once again, makes this taxonomy of this group very difficult. Same with uh, Drosera stipularis and Drosera petularis in Queensland. They, you might say, um, they grow in pretty different habitats. Um, can't really imagine them crossing, but they do, <laughs> and they back cross as well. So, uh, uh, very um, hybrid prone uh, section in the wild. All species are intercompatible, or at least to my knowledge. I don't know about the annuals like Drosera banksii and Drosera um, subtilis, um, but the rosetted species are all intercompatible intercompatible. <laughs> um, uh, most of the rosetted species as well are all um, uh, self-incompatible, so they're obligate outcrossers. They need a genetically uh, different individual to produce seed, which naturally increases uh, the genetic diversity of a population. So overall, in summary, um, very difficult group, um, but I mainly went over the care of the two extremes in terms of phenotype at least, um, really glabrous, kind of swampy growers, and more arid, uh, dry growers. And um, the other species kind of, uh, in my opinion at least, like fall in between there. That's just stuff like Drosera petiolaris, Drosera uh, dilatato petiolaris, and Drosera brumensis. Um, but yeah. If you liked listening to this extended rant on <laughs> um, uh, my sundews, um, f feel free to follow me on my Instagram page, Insects Inside Nursery, where I'll post more about sundews as well as uh, various other carnivorous plants and carnivorous plants in the wild uh, that I see in the Gulf Coast as well as uh, ones that I find uh, up in eastern Washington. Um,
thanks for listening, and once again, have a happy world. It's Day not a surprise that gardeners, educators, and scientists are fascinated by these unique plants. The International Carnivorous Plant Society or ICPS, not only love these plants, but welcomes growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. The ICPS even started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate them. The free online event is held the first Wednesday of May. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask! We don't bite, but our plants do.